Wicked Naked with your host, author Kat Robinson, only on DTMWickedRadio.com. And Wicked Radio is Wicked Naked. I am your show host, Pat Holden Robinson. I have missed you guys. I've missed you guys. It's been three long weeks, and you know what's coming. Wait for it. Before you get your knickers in a twist, and plug your grandma's ears. Wicked Naked has nothing to do with being naked. It has everything to do with what lies beneath the surface. Because, guys, you know, it's cool to get all dressed up. It's, you know, we want to go out. We want to look awesome. And, you know, we put on our... Our coolest clothes and our designers, you know, hopefully we got into thrift store because if not, you're not being financially responsible. But at the end of the day, it is what lies beneath our surface that is impactful, that makes a difference on our world and our own lives and the lives of others. And, you know, as little, little mention, uh, a little, little child once said, the world is a scary place. And, it, and, you know, I'll tell you, I'm getting older. It's hard to remember things verbatim. I almost never use, like, the little in-the-air quote marks anymore because I'm getting to the age where I'm not sure if that's actually the quote. I might be, you know, ad-libbing, but I try to at least get the point across. And this little child said, it's a scary world. Unfortunately, it is kind of scary. And I think that's why I and a lot of people that I know really try to speak out those things because they are beautiful. And I've had a lot of people uh, guessing on Wicked Naked that remind me of why I still believe in people and why I still believe that there is beauty and joy in this world. You know, I've had authors and I have had animal rescuers, and these people just have a piece of my heart because those things are very close to home for me. Collective eye rolls, yes, I'm an author, yes, I've written two books, yes, they're available at (laughs) Amazon.com. Under the pen name, Holden Robinson, don't forget, took that name uh, to honor my daddy who has left this world and is probably watching right now going, what is going on with her hair? Uh, But anyway, I have a really cool guest on the show tonight, Um, the incomparable songbird, my friend, Missy Harris, is going to come on here probably in about 10, 12 minutes time now, and she is going to talk to us about her journey as a vocalist, as a woman, as a human being, and I love to surround myself with people who just we have the best in me and because I can share their journey and it gives me hope for my own and that's what we really need to do. We really need to raise each other up. And I and I know that we know that. But I gotta tell you something guys. Maybe like some of you have forgotten. Because I'm a little disappointed in a lot of things that go on in the world today and I'm sure that you are too. And so that's why I surround myself with folks like Missy. Uh, my author friends and my animal rescue friends because they remind me that there are still people in our world who are making a positive impact, who are filling the world with passion and beauty and song and art and, you know, their passion for rescuing those who can't take care of themselves. So that is really, really cool. Um, I am going to let Missy you know, give us her story when she comes on. But I have a funny feeling that Missy, like, pops out of the room singing a Broadway song. I just have a feeling that's probably what happened and the nurses were like, hey, <laughs> that's cool. Because I kind of think, guys, that, you know, as an, an actor and singer myself, I might have actually come kicking and screaming into this world the same way. Now, my mother doesn't recount that as part of the story. She doesn't tell a story that, like, you you know, came out singing songs from, I'm going to date myself here, but let me try to think of a musical that actually was in existence prior to me being in existence, and I'm not even going to give it a shot, so I don't want to go look and try and figure out how old I am, but anyway, you know, actually, mostly, the funny thing is, is I was born the day after Thanksgiving, and no, I'm not going to tell you the year, um, and I hear that story a lot, you know, you were born the day before Thanksgiving, and evidently your food was lousy. And, you know, I always, as a kid, I, I kind of thought that was cool, you know. Because you know, I, I figured I, surely I was the only one born right around Thanksgiving. There's, when you're a child, you don't, you can't really contemplate, like, a billion people. Because that's a lot. You know, you might have 10 or 12 in your close-knit group or your family. So, you know, a billion is, is a lot. So, you know, obviously I know now as an adult that 
you know, there are more people born on my birthday than, than you know, to me. But I always kind of, then as I got older, I kind of felt responsible. Like, how dare I come right around Thanksgiving? Nobody should be in the hospital on Thanksgiving. And, you know, then as I got older, I realized, hey, wait a minute. I didn't exactly conceive myself, you know. So I, I realize now, you know, as, a, as an adult, as someone who's, you know, passed a few uh, decades, that I mean, that wasn't me. I didn't have anything to do with that. You know, it's not like the, you know, little the swimmers were in there and, you know, I was this unfertilized egg going, hey, guys, over here, over here. Come on, we're going to miss the day before Thanksgiving. Where are you going? You didn't look for directions, did you? Anyway, I realized that, you know, I didn't have anything to do with that, so to speak. But back to coming out, you know, the singing. Um, I think I was singing when I was like five years old. As a matter of fact, I know I was because somewhere buried in my grandmother's keepsake, bless her heart, she's still with us at 94, um, with this fabulous white perm now that she has. I saw her today, and she's got this fluffy white hair, and and she's just so cute. And it's heartbreaking because here's this little lady and she's, you know, kind of fading away one day at a time and it's really painful to watch. And it's hard to remind yourself that you have to be grateful that she's still here. You know, we might have chosen a different capacity, you know, in which she'd be here where she could still be part of the conversation and talking about the same things that we are. Uh, but, you know, bless her heart, she's still here. And, and I know somewhere in her keepsake she has this probably dusty old cassette which, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I understand that there used to be this thing called a cassette player. And um, watch the Long Island Medium if you don't know what that is, because she still uses one. You know, she uses this, what we would now call this vintage thing. And I know that somewhere Grandma has this thing, and I'm singing Delta Dog. And I remember hearing it. And it was horrible. I mean, it was just awful. Um, thankfully... Um, like a miracle, I got better. <laughs> um, thankfully, I got better because that was just dreadful. I mean, it was adorable in a really horrific way. Um, but I always had that. And I'm like, you know, when you're a little kid, you don't realize how lucky you are to have that. You know, I can still remember the sixth grade operetta. I played this little Dutch girl, and I remember that my partner was like this tall kid, and he, I was tall. You know, we were like, really tall. We actually looked like windmills because we were so tall. Uh, and I remember, he, I think he sang the wrong lyrics. So I turned around and became a windmill, you know, too soon, which, you know, that was my first blunder on stage. Which actually, that might not have been my first blunder on stage, but that is the first memorable blunder I had on stage. And even, even then, despite the blunder, you know, the curtain opens and, and the, the audience is there. And I've talked to you guys about stuff like this before. If you don't have something in, in your life um, that makes me feel like I feel when I'm on the stage performing with my theater group or how Missy feels, my guest tonight, when she goes out and she performs for an audience, you guys don't have something like that. Here's my recommendation. Get it. Get something like that. You know, and I, and I can't tell you... Um, to go and do a theater production because I don't know if that's your thing. Maybe it's not your thing. But you know what? My one hope for you guys is that if you if that's not your thing, if you don't have your thing, I hope you find it because that is so incredibly amazing. Uh, recently, you guys know that I did a production uh, with a local community theater organization. We did the production of Rent. And, you know, every once in a while you just get the miracle of being able to be involved in something that makes pure magic. And, you know, it's, it's kind of like, and I, I, I'm not asking you guys to, you know, believe in a higher power or to be spiritual because that's up to you. But I'm spiritual. I believe in a higher power. And it's almost like God sets his watch, you know, for opening night and the curtain opened and God said, you know what, just for this one night, I'm going to let it be perfect. And I hope that you guys have moments like that. And when you do, I hope you take the time to pause and realize how very fortunate you are, not only to have those moments, but to realize how blessed you are. You know, what a miracle it is that not only you had it, but you realized 
the magnitude of experiencing something like that. You know, some people hang glide, some people fly planes, you know, some people go up in hot air balloons. You know, we're, I think we're all, to a degree, we're all thrill seekers. You know, we want to do something that gets our blood pumping and makes us feel truly alive. I mean, I count myself very, very lucky and consider myself very, very lucky because I still get to have my feet on the ground when I do something like that. I know jumping out of an airplane just kind of freaks me out. You know, I've, I've flown commercially a few times, and, and actually we, we stay in the plane, and, and that works for me. That's very cool. You know, I get out of the plane when the plane lands, and, and other people get out of the plane with me when the plane lands. And, you know, and that seems to be kind of a normal way of doing it. Um, having the doors open and having you exit the plane before you've actually landed, that, that to me seems a little absurd. Because um, when we're up there, I'm like reading a book. You know, I'm, I'm like, I'm eating my $7 peanuts that will, you know, fit in a Dixie cup and still leave much room for 50 more bags of little peanuts to fit in the same cup. That's what I'm doing when I'm at that elevation. You know, but if that's your thrill, if that's the thing that does it for you, then get in that plane, go up there, and jump. Just find that thing. Um, So I'm really, really super glad that I have that, and I'm really grateful for the fact that, you know, I have guests come on the show, and they've got that too. When we start talking about our crazy little, you know, wow moments, I love it that they get it. I get it. They get it. You know, we kind of commune as getting it, and that's really cool. So, you know, i got to tell you, um, Missy has actually released a single. I'm going to let her talk about that. You know, that is an incredible, incredible, incredible achievement. You know, and it's, it's so wonderful to have an achievement like that like that but I know that it's also the journey has been magnificent and that's the thing that we have to remember is you know it's great to have the wow moment but don't forget to appreciate those little steps that you took to get yourself there because you know as an author I remember the moment I I held my first book in my hand and I looked at it and I was like wow you know this is cool I wrote this but there were amazing moments that led up to that and I never wanted to lose sight of those and actually you guys you know this is a radio show so you obviously don't see me and considering how my hair came out today I'm actually yeah it's a good thing for you Um, but I've got this ring on and it actually makes the coolest sound and I have just enough Italian that you know I talk with my hands and have the propensity for a big butt you know I don't have the beautiful olive skin I didn't get that part but I did get the you know if you tie my hands I can't talk and I admit that so, you know, I'm talking with my hands while I'm talking to you guys. And it's just, the ring is just shaking a little bit, and and it's, it's kind of a cool sound. So, because after a while, the sound of my own voice is like nails on the chalkboard. So, you know what, speaking of which, let me check in with the producer, see if perhaps we have the lovely Missy. If not, I can drone on for a few more minutes. Um, but do we have the lovely Missy? I'm going to take that to be not yet. Okay. And that's okay because actually I'm excited and um, it will be worth the wait. I'm just getting a little antsy here because I, you know, I love to talk to you guys. I love to talk about things that matter, things that are happening in my world, your world, the world in general. But I'll tell you something. I love having a guest. You know, not only do I have the benefit of having like three seconds to try take a drink of my water bottle. Um, but it's, it's just great to share this show. And also, you know, you guys are fantastic for taking time out of your busy lives to come and listen to this show. Of all the things that you could be doing, whether you're listening live or you're listening later on in a podcast, you chose to do this. And I really, really appreciate that. But I appreciate the fact that my guests get to speak with you too. You know, they get to tell their story, and they get to share with you the things that they've done to impact their world and to make a difference, you know, not just in, in what they do and in their life, but, you know, perhaps in yours, because the ripple effect of doing something positive is very long-lasting. You know, I mean, we've all taken a leaf or a little flower and we've dropped it into a body of water, and we stand there, and we watch it as long as we can, 
but we don't have any idea where it ends up. And, I, you know, I like to think on a positive side that the ripple effect of doing something good is very much like that. It can impact someone that you don't even know. You know, something you do can touch the life of someone that you've never met. You know, unfortunately, the flip side of that operates as well. And, you know, I've always said the ripple effect of dishonesty is, you know, and unfortunately, I've been the same. I really hope that it doesn't because it's a pain. Um, it, it's hard to, to get over that and, and move beyond that. You know, but like I always say, guys, it's not the way, it's not about how you fall. I always say it's, it's about the integrity with which you get up and keep going and try to learn from what happened and try to turn it in and spin it into something positive, you know, because you, you can do that. Um, so we realize that, like, I haven't said a bad word yet, which for me is like a milk. I'm 16 minutes in, guys, and I haven't said anything yet. I have not said anything that would make my grandma pull her ears. So that's pretty cool. But, you know, it's funny. There's, there's an expression in it. I'm on the back of my friend's book, and it says, if anyone could spin shit into vanilla. And, you know, sometimes we're all in a situation, because being human is hard and bad things happen to us, you know what? Sometimes we're just left with that. That's the task you're left with. You know, you kind of land in a pile of it, and with any luck, you know, you can spin some of it into vanilla and come out with something more positive than what you might have expected to rise out of that mess with. You know, and that's the beauty of life, because there are things that knock us down. But, you know, the decision to stay down is ultimately ours, because we all have the opportunity to, you know, keep going and rise up and keep kicking, and... And a lot of times, it's that one thing that gets us because nobody can take that away from you, whether you're a songbird or you're a teacher, you know, or you're a few cities. You know, nobody can take that away from you. Those unique parts of you, nope, you're going to stand in court and somebody's going to take that away from you. Unless, of course, you feel over the moment that that's the kind of part we're talking about, then yes, perhaps somebody might make you give it back. If you guys know what I mean. So I have another team that marks here. So I'm going to check it again and see if we have Missy. Do we have Missy? I am here. Missy, hello. Welcome to Wicked Naked. How are you? Thank you so much. I'm super excited to be here. I'm doing great. Enjoying this beautiful weather today. It is fabulous. We're in upstate New York, guys. If you don't know, um, we're in upstate New York, and it is it is blended. So I know I made a joke earlier in the show, Missy, I don't know if you heard it, but that we probably like came out of the womb like a pop out singing a Broadway song. <laughs> it's true. We did. I did, thank you. Now, that's you know, the Broadway is just I don't know if you can relate to it. There's always something that just kind of touches you and always uh, for me, it always throws me back to a situation or an emotion or a relationship. So I'm uh, really liking the Broadway very, very early on. Me too. I do too. It's, you know what? There's, there's a beauty in getting to step out of yourself and become somebody else, even just for a little while. Oh, absolutely. I find it actually really cathartic, which is probably not healthy at all. But <laughs> for me, it's a great way to release my emotions and, you know, get yeah, out some of those things that we kind of push in heat sometimes. Just, I don't know. The music always just carries me away, which is a beautiful thing. Absolutely. And, like I said, we get to do it with our feet still on the ground because it's a to me, it's a thrill, and I'm sure it's got to feel the same way for you. The moment that curtain opens and that, that quick moment of silence before it begins, you almost wish you could freeze it. Oh, I love it. I you know, love The tension in the air, the energy in the air, that it's like when you, you hold your breath just for a minute, and then you exhale, and everything just explodes, and it's amazing. It absolutely is. So, so I, I can imagine that your journey has been long, but I know it's a very celebratory thing to release a single. So tell us a little bit about the single that you recently released. 
guys, we know this, it fails. And if you're one of my author buddies out there, there's nothing like a good power outage to knock out a half a chapter and make you want to pick your computer up and go office space on it in the backyard. So um, we're going to call Missy back into the show. You know what? If you guys hung on through the couple of minutes of silence, i got to tell you, you're rock stars. Because I'm not sure what I would have done. I might have gone and, you know, play a video game or something. So if you're still listening, um, if you're hanging on in, in a later podcast and you're still listening, thank you. Um, I think pretty much those of us once in a while, uh, there is a glitch. And <laughs> there is definitely, there definitely was a glitch here tonight. So hopefully we've got Missy back. I am back. I'm so sorry. Oh. What happened? Uh, I don't know. I think we just temporarily lost the signal. You know, i got to tell you, I'm like, the, I can send emails, and I can actually create documents and do some pretty mad marketing pieces, but I have absolutely no idea when my, you know, how the computer works. I don't, I don't really know how. I mean, if it's broken, I take it to somebody who can fix it, because I don't know. I don't want to know. So I just think we landed in technology glitch land. I am right there with you. I'm like a, you know, insert turn key kind of girl. So. Yeah, exactly. Like, press start, you know, it, go to the main screen, you know, click on Google Chrome, and, you know, do your thing. And when that doesn't happen, you know, it's kind of like a scratch your head moment. Or you're like, so I think it's better whatever my time slot, so. What's that? I said either that or I just ran off my, over my time slot. Oh, for me? Oh, no. You didn't run over your time slot. <laughs> yeah, bye, Missy. <laughs> Click. <laughs> okay, we we actually try not to say goodbye to guests like that here on uh, Wicked Naked. Usually we at least let them finish their sentence. So if I've asked you to be a guest, please don't expect that this is how your interview will go uh, because this is actually the first time this has ever happened. Uh, but we've had some technological glitches in the past, but we have a fantastic production uh, staff. They got us hooked up and live again. So, Tiffany, Denny, thank you. Um, you guys saved us tonight. So, gosh, Missy, welcome back. It's been a while since you've been on the show. Thanks. I feel like I've never left. <laughs> yeah, it's just, I, I feel like I've talked to these my friends out in Woods in the Land just, you know, just a few minutes ago. It's uh, Usually I air every two weeks, so I'm calling in again so quickly. I was like, am I doing the right thing? Uh, but I'm definitely doing the right thing, and I'm so glad you're back. Me you know, I, think, I think the last thing you said was I, I was so excited I almost fell over. <laughs> and I was like, gosh, I hope you didn't fall. And then it was like, Missy? Did you actually fall? Is she on the floor? <laughs> oh, no. Probably on stool. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I'm actually still in my little corner of my couch with my laptop right here and the charger close at hand, which actually, at first I thought, you know, when I didn't actually hear anything as they kept talking and I didn't get a response, and I thought, oh, my gosh, my phone died. Because, you know, that's the, pretty much how we do Internet radio. Everybody calls in, and we have a great conversation, but we're all on our devices. So if we've forgotten to charge them, we're up to Chris. Yeah, I actually plugged mine in just in case because I was concerned. Yeah. Okay. Well, welcome back to Wicked Naked. For those of you just tuning in, I am Kat Robinson. I am here with Missy Harris, who is talking about um, a new musical called Ferris and the new single that she recently released, which is, if I correct me if I'm wrong, the first single uh, from this album. That is correct. It is okay. very first. It's only available digitally right now. So okay. we're just testing the waters and just kind of getting some feedback and some reactions and seeing what everybody thinks. Now, I know, have you heard anything from the Spanish? Because I know you were a hit recently in Spain. Yeah, apparently uh, the single is number 10 on the Spanish digital music chart, which is yeah. super exciting. And uh, we're making waves in Finland as well. That is uh, very cool. Um, I guess the international market is Spain and Finland. Well, you know what? 
I think we can say you were an international sensation. Sure, I'll go with that. I think, <laughs> you know, I, I think that's just fine. It's, you know, it's just us. So, well, good for you. And I know you've done, I mean, I've only known you for a few months. Already you have done some really cool things. And I can't imagine that your theater journey began when I met you. So, I mean, when, what was that first moment that you knew this is something you wanted to do? How far back does that go for you? My very first audition, I was eight years old, and I was auditioning for Summerstock in Corning, New York. Uh, they were doing the King and I. I was just auditioning for, you know, one of the King's children. And I got up, and I wanted to do it so, so badly. And I got up there, and I cried my way through the entire audition because I was terrified. <laughs> just so terrified that nobody would like me. Oh. That, that was my first audition experience. However, I just I wanted to do it so much. It made me work that much harder to try to be comfortable in front of an audience and just try to relax and really show people what I thought that I could do. And that is a hard thing to overcome. That is really difficult. Yeah, I mean, stage fright for me has always been one of those battles that I've always fought. But at the same time, it's one of those battles that I've always kind of enjoyed because it gives me, like, a great sense of accomplishment when I can go out and be completely comfortable on stage. So I'm at the point now where I've always been nervous right before, and then once I get on stage, everything just comes together. And exactly. I, I connect with the character, I connect with the audience, and I feel... It's very comfortable in my own skin in that in that moment. That is cool. But I'll tell you, live theater, there's nothing like it. Because I, I mean, I had a couple of moments where it was like, mm, something's gone wrong. <laughs> and I think, you know, we all have that one show that's so memorable. And not because it wasn't good, because, you know, even at the, you know, even at the community theater level, the talent is so impressive that if you just overcome, you know, a, a set piece can fall over, and somehow we just we just gloss over it, and the show must go on. And and I'm sure you must have a story about something like that. My absolute favorite live theater moment involving a set piece. We were doing we were doing a miracle on 34th Street. Oh, I've done that. Okay. So, great, I mean, great story. We're at the point where myself and the character Fred are just um, she's getting back into her apartment. She's crying. She's upset. She's looking to Fred for comfort. And then all of a sudden, the whole side wall door area just falls over. <laughs> <laughs> and Fred we talked on a tool belt, <laughs> and everything was fine. <laughs> Oh, and this is the best part of the story. You know, so there's that that five-second gap, which seems like a lifetime, where in your head you're trying to figure out, what do we do? Do we press it? Do we go on? You know, that part of the stage is kind of dark. Can we can someone fix it while we're working? Before I even have time for my brain to get into all that, the stage manager walks on set, says, excuse me, ma'am, I'm the super. I'm here to fix the door. <laughs> puts it back in its, in its stabilizers, off she goes, and I just, I, it was one of the best live theater moments. It was yeah. so perfect and so flawless, and it was, it was one of the best fixes I've ever seen. I loved it. I will that always remember it. amazing. You know what, and I, that audience, got, they really got the live theater experience, and that's a great comeback. I'm here to fix the door. <laughs> oh, it was great. Yeah, everybody's in character. We all just did our thing. The stage manager took on a whole other life of her own. <laughs> did what needed to be done. And that, that's one of the great things about live theater is that you never know what's going to happen. No. The show can go off like it has a hundred times, or it may be completely different. Oh, my gosh. That is so cool. One of my best ones was The Missing Pecans. 
and it was Crimes of the Heart. I don't know if you've ever seen that show. It was, for me, it was like a little miracle because I, I actually got to act on stage with my daughter and we played sisters. Oh! And it, it was so, so cool. And somebody forgot to take out the, and, you know, it was, and I was getting, you know, gearing up to go out and, you know, it was an emotional moment and I think I played, I think my character was Meg. I think that was her name. And somebody comes over and says, it's a concert out there. What do you want to do? You know, like stage whispering. You know, much quieter. But, of course, it sounds like it's, you know, know, somebody announcing a football stadium because you're not supposed to be talking. And I said, what the bleep do you want me to do? I'm not out there yet. You know, so I get out there, and Doc is sitting at the table, and he just, you know, so casually looks at me, and he says, I forgot something in the truck. I'll be right back. (laughs) <laughs> and we just fiddled with whatever, you know, we got the extra bang of the screen door, which was so cool because that was so, you know, out in the woods in a farmhouse kind of southern moment where the screen door bangs. And he comes back in and he drops them on the table. And I thought, you know what, that's a great recovery. And, you know, we fixed it. You know, I love the, coat, the coat rack falling over in the southern comedy, you know, not so smooth. But I played this cantankerous flower shop owner, and I was like, somebody fix it. And it, you know, it was, it was, and that was, it would have been in character for me to be annoyed. Like, what is that? Somebody fix that. You know, and they did. I think it was actually dress rehearsal, but I think it was dressed with an audience. So it was so kind of funny. Because, you know, two people is an audience. Absolutely. I once played to 11 during a, a snowstorm. 11 people is an audience. You know, I feel like as long as there's one person in the audience, then they get the same show that an audience of 10,000 would get. Absolutely. They're just as invested. They deserve just as strong of a performance as any size audience. So any, as long as there's at least one, you get full score, at least for me. Absolutely. Yeah. And we've all picked up lines for somebody else, you know, or to kind of casually shout out a reminder of what the next line could be or covered up when somebody misses an entrance. You know, we actually, I think we ran through like a page and a half one time because somebody missed an entrance. And, you know, I got the opportunity to say, I already told you that and set the line again because little did the audience know they kind of jumped back a page and a half when the girl actually made the entrance. <laughs> God. So what, we all have that one moment that it was so amazing that we're not sure it's going to come again. So, and I, I always hope that it does. I hope it does for me. I hope it does for you. But what was your worst? I mean, I've been really, really lucky in that I've had quite a few of those moments. I just, I feel very lucky anytime I get to walk on stage and work my craft and do the thing that I love to do the most. I think the most recent one was probably uh, doing company. We just did a production of company with Half Light Theater, uh, which is a group where I'm the artistic director. And we do um, anywhere from two to six shows a year, kind of depending on the year and the number of volunteers and staff that we have. Um, on, in May, we did a production of Company by Stephen Sondheim, which is in and of itself an amazing show. And yeah. I ended up playing Joanne, which and I'm a little young for the stereotypical Joanne. And the director decided that she kind of wanted to take her in a new direction and really give her a little bit of heart in this production. Which, um, the director always felt like, in other productions, Joanne is lacking a little bit of heart, and it's difficult to kind of to see her point of view, kind of, you know, relate with her on a human level. Right. So during her big Lady Who Lunch number, which is, you know, always a big belty song sung by so many iconic women, I was terrified to even begin to approach it. And I was actually ended up being really lucky and blessed that the director wanted to take in such a different direction. So she decided that during the song, the character of Joanne is singing.
thinking about the other women in the production. It kind of, and for those that don't know, Joanne is very hard biting. She's, you know, very sarcastic, very snide, has a smart comment for everybody, really looks down her nose at the world, but mostly because she's covering up her own insecurities. Right. So she's seeing ladies to lunch, and rather than have the large big belt you know, at the end, the director said, I would like this moment in time to let Joanne to kind of have a small breakdown in the middle of the club. I would like her to just, you know, remove that curtain and really reveal how she feels when she gets to the verse that's about her. And it was, it was a challenge, and I was completely into it and had so much fun with it. It was, it was exhausting, but invigorating all at the same time. So I did song, I had my little breakdown, and entire theater, which had, I think, just, I think for the, not average, we had just about 80 to 90 people a night, on average. Mm-hmm. So I did my big song, and the entire theater is just completely silent. You you hear nothing. There's no rustling, there's no, you know, rappers, there's no shuffling in the seats, it's just completely silent. And I remember inhaling, and my breath actually echoed. It was so quiet. <laughs> and it was, in, I would say, probably for a good 30 seconds, 60 seconds. It seemed like longer than that because I had nothing to do. And I was just kind of having my own little internal puzzle-piecing ordeal, kind of trying to put the character back together so that we could go on with the scene. And out of nowhere, just this thunderous applause erupted awesome. with scenes and, you know, shouts of bravo. And I just, it was one of those overwhelming feelings that just made me feel so blessed and so humble and so appreciative and just so relieved that they enjoyed it. Because, I mean, it was really, it was a step. It was a departure from what the usual protocol of that song is. And it was, so that's not probably my most recent moment where it just, you know, just everybody's energy and enjoyment just completely washed over me. Yeah. And it, you know, it really helped in putting that character back together so we could keep going with the scene. Exactly. You got kind of got that reinforcement that Joanne needed. Exactly. They're, they're okay with me being a human. Wow. Yeah, it was a beautiful thing, and it was. I I was so excited, and it just you know it's just one of those I call the movie moment. Every once yeah. in a while, I have one of those moments that you kind of fantasize about, or you see in a movie, and you know, sometimes those happen in real life, and I just, I love to see where those moments and really hold on to them and work oh. for the next one. And, you know, it's always surpri- a surprise when they come. You can never plan a moment like that. So when they do come, I just think we should really enjoy them and just hold on to them in our hearts. Oh, my gosh. You, you just said something that last statement, Missy, is so poignant for me because I do have one, and I don't know if it will ever come again, it, it, not in the capacity that it did, um, but I did Sound of Music in 2005, and I wanted to be Maria so badly until I said climb the mountain, and then I see Mother Superior, in that moment I was just pleased to give that to be Maria, that's how I felt about it, and my dad was fighting at a stage pancreatic cancer. And it was and it was cold and it was an hour drive and the he made the commitment and he came and he had a nap and he had to take me with me. But he came and it was the last day of the show. And you know, it's a very defining moment from her superior right before she sits that song and everything kinda of gets quiet and the spotlight comes on and it I mean it's the struggle for me to say so you talk about it and not break it down because it was like standing in the light 
of God and no respect to anyone in the audience. But he basically just vanished. And it was a man and his little girl. And she was going to deliver the performance of a lifetime because he he deserved that. And he would never get to experience it ever again. And the song was absolutely flawless. You know, I actually said this already in the show. It was like God looks at his watch and says, okay, for this one moment, I'm going to let it be perfect. You know, but this second over time, and it just was perfection. And I remember curtain closed, and, you know, my mother said, you got to stand in motion, which you don't know because the curtain is closed. And I just emotionally collapsed. And I still remember crying into this man's suit, and I don't know how much a drag case there was, but <laughs> it was. I mean, I, I could have lived my whole life and only had that one moment, and it would have been enough. That is the magnitude. That was cool. Oh, beautiful. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. You're welcome. You are welcome. I actually have not talked about that in a while, and it, it's amazing that it's still, like, I'm changing right now, but that's, you know, it's cool that if you get to activate a little bit of that magic just by telling the story again, because I'm, I'm right back there. You know, I'm in the non costume, and the spotlight comes up, and I can so I can walk into the Martin Chapel Theater, and I can tell you where they were sitting. You know, because it's, I know I couldn't see them. You can't see the audience. I mean, every once in a while you can. But realistically, you know, when the house is turned low and there's just a spot, you can't. But I could. I'm not you no. Yeah, I just knew. And... You know, my mother said she could hear him, you know, that he was just, he was just in it. He was so invested. And, you know, I'm so glad I could give him that because it was awful. It was awful to watch somebody go through 10 months like that. But in a way, in a weird way, it's a gift because you do, you just celebrate every moment because you know you're not going to get it again. So, absolutely. So, this is the contract that we'll talk about. Now, are, do you expect that you get to play the role at some point? Uh, you know, there's always that hope. Uh, I know that there are producers who are, you know, let's get a show, shop it, show. Um, actors never know when or if they get to ride and lose the show. Right. You know, it's kind of, I think we all hope that we do. Um, it's really because the problem is, is that the decision never rides with the people that you start the project with. As right. more and more people become involved, more and more, more people get involved in the decision making process. Um, I, you know, I try not to get my hopes up for anything like that. Um, I mean, of course, Ideally, it would be amazing if the show was picked up and if they took me with them and I could actually perform this all live would be phenomenal and, a, and yet another dream come true. Just really enjoying it, taking in this new music and working with this writer who I have come to love so much. Um, it looks like we're going to be doing a music video to kind of go with it to promote a little bit more of the single. So I'll be looking cool. forward to doing that in another month. And, you know, in the meantime, I'm just enjoying the projects as they come and loving the work that I get to do. How, now, I have to ask you, how long is the single? Single is, is um, about three minutes, about three and a half minutes. Just over three minutes, somewhere thereabouts. Okay. All right. We wrap up here. Um, in just a few minutes, do you have permission to play the single for us? I do have permission to play the single if you'd like to hear it. You know what, guys? Uh, we're going to close the show, and we're going to let Missy and her remarkable rendition of My Sacrifice 
from Ferris the Musical. I'm going to let her sing us out tonight. So you guys know I'll be back in two weeks, and until then, you know what to do. Tell the people in your life how much you appreciate them. You know, they, they know you love them, but you know what? They need to hear this sometimes. So you guys be good, make a positive impact on your world, and I will see you in two weeks on Internet Radio. Missy, I'm going, I love to say things like this. Girlfriend, take it away. <laughs> Thank you so much, Pat. Stay with us, guys. I'm hoping we don't have a technical glitch. Run it. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were actually playing it. I apologize. I, I'm oh, my goodness. To... Okay, <laughs> if you guys have stayed with us, thank you. No, I, can't, I actually can't download it. It won't play. Gotcha. Uh, let me see what I can do on my end. Give me two seconds. Stay with me. Okay. Everybody out there at Internet Radio Listener Land is like, now what happened? Pass the chip. All right, we've got a couple of more minutes here. We don't want to. You know what, you guys, stick around. If you're listening live, stick around because Wicked Weather is up next. And this is cool. You need to listen. Did I mention that I'm not a technical wizard? You know, <laughs> honey, that's okay. You know what, guys? Go out. Go to Amazon. Buy the single. It's 99 cents. You know what? It'll transport back you back to a time when you were a little kid. And this witch, this queen, wicked queen, just frightened you so much. I would love to see her in a different light. So, guys, go to Amazon.com. Look for Missy Harris. Download this, this single, uh, My Sacrifice from Ferris the Musical. You know what? We'll have Missy come back again sometime, and we'll play that song for you. So I am your host of Wicked Naked, Kat Robinson. Guys, thanks for tuning in. There's a lot of things you could do with your Saturday night. I am super humbled that you chose to spend it with me. And I will see you in two weeks right back here at Wicked Naked. Have a great Saturday night. Be well. <laughs>